The Pre-Med Year, session number 204. Hello and welcome to The Pre-Med Years, where we believe that collaboration, not competition, is key to your pre-med success. I'm your host, Dr. Ryan Gray, and in this podcast, we share with you stories, encouragement, and information that you need to know to help guide you on your path to becoming a physician. Welcome to the Pre-Med Years podcast. We are part of the MedEd Media Network. You can find at MEDEDmedia.com. Again, that's MedEdmedia.com. Now, today's podcast is going to be me and me alone talking to you and basically telling you what I wish every pre med would know. Now, I could just spill my guts here and tell you everything that I know, and then I wouldn't have to have a podcast anymore. But unfortunately, it doesn't work like that because there's no way I can tell you everything that I know in one podcast episode. And so I'm going to talk to you about some of the most common things that I see pre-med students struggle with, the students that I work with for application prep, the students that I work with doing personal statement editing and mock interview prep. These are a, a lot of common trends and themes that I see and, and as well as questions that we get coming into the old pre-meds forums and questions that are emailed to me directly. So I think this podcast, you are going to need to favorite, subscribe, download, whatever terminology your your podcast app uses. And I think you may, I'm hoping that you will come back to this episode time and time again. So with that said, Let's go ahead and start off at the beginning about what I wish every pre-med would know. And that first thing is that you can go as a pre-med anywhere that you want to go for your undergrad education. And that includes community college. I think too often the pre-med world tells you that community colleges are off limits. Now, again, there, there are going to be some medical schools that look at your transcript and see that you went to a community college and are going to frown upon that, but that's not all of the schools. So you need to take a look at what you require, what fits into your schedule, what fits into your budget, and figure out what you can do with that. If that means going to a community college for a year and then transferring to a four-year institution, great. If that means only going to a community college for all of your pre-med um, requirements, then that's okay too. You'll make it work. There's an amazing episode I did back uh, in episode 74 with Carrie. She was a first-year medical student at the time that I talked to her, and she shared her story of being... Uh, a single mom for the most part because her husband was overseas flying helicopters for the army. And she shared her story of going, working full time, going to community college, constantly checking in with the medical schools that she was interested in going to, and eventually getting into medical school, getting into an MD school for some of you that, that think, oh, if I go to a community college then I can only get into a DO school because the MD schools aren't going aren't gonna to like me. Um, she, she got into an MD school. So go check out her episode. If you haven't heard that one yet, you can listen to that one at medicalschoolhq.net slash seven four. So that's Carrie. So go wherever you want. I had a long conversation with a mother of a high school student and he wanted to be a pre-med. He was super aggressive already with his uh, shadowing and research experience and and everything else and as a high school student and he was looking at undergrad institutions to go to and I kept trying to tell her it doesn't matter where he goes go somewhere that will fit for him as a student and figure it out from there and and they were too stuck on 
what school was going to be best for research opportunities, what school was going to be best for clinical experiences, what school was going to be best for whatever. They were they were too far in the weeds of what school is going to look best, what school is going to prepare him the best, and I kept coming back to go wherever he is going to be happy. So that is my advice for you. Go wherever you will be happy. Period. End of story. Along those same lines, the next one I have listed here is study anything. Again, the pre-med world says you need to go to a top undergrad institution to get into medical school. You need to to study chemistry, biology, biochemistry, microbiology to to be a competitive applicant for medical school. And I call BS on that one as well. Uh, BS on the first one, BS on the second one. So you can major in whatever you want and go to medical school. You can major in the humanities. You can major in a language, which I guess is humanities. Uh, I think maybe, I don't know, it's too long ago. <laughs> you can You can major in political sciences, you can major in anything that you want and still go to medical school. So study anything, go anywhere, go wherever is going to fit the best for you, study something that is going to fit the best for you. You'll see this trend here as I talk. It's all about you. You cannot go through this process always wondering what you're going to be doing for somebody else, how this is going to look for your application, how that is going to look for your application, where you're going, how is that going to look, what you're studying, how is that going to look, what I'm doing volunteer-wise, how is that going to look, what's this extracurricular extracurricular look like, does this research look good, does this publication look good? You cannot go through your education as a pre-med thinking that because you're going to drive yourself crazy, you're going to burn yourself out, and in the end, as as an admissions committee member looks at your application, they can easily see that you're probably not passionate about anything that you're doing and you're just doing it to check off the boxes. So that's number two, study anything. The third thing on here is something I talk about all the time. It's in my opening to every episode, and that's collaboration, not competition. Now, I was at the UC Davis conference a couple weeks ago now, the pre-health conference, and I was talking to a somebody associated with a pharmacy school, and we were talking about Student Doctor Network. And he made an interesting comment that I wholeheartedly disagreed with to some extent and agreed with on another extent. So we we were both agreeing that Student Doctor Network is is not the best resource for students. And then he took it up another level and said that he's talked to his students about why they go on to these sites and post about what has helped them or their experiences during an interview day. And and he came at it from the standpoint of why are you helping somebody else beat you? And I, I, a little part of me died inside when he said that because what we talk about here is collaboration, not competition. As you enter the world of medicine as a physician and even as a pharmacist, which is the, the schools that he's represent, representing, you work collaboratively with other people. And so the fact that he is going out there and saying, don't help somebody else, why do that? just, it hurt me to hear that. And so that's why I love this community. You listening to this right here, you understand collaboration, not competition. Everybody, the the 2000 people that are in our private Facebook group, which if you're not part of, go to medicalschoolhq.net slash group. All of those students in there collaborate. And it's amazing to see. And guess what? I haven't had one complaint that said, oh, my seat for medical school was taken away because somebody else got it who I had helped. That's never going to happen ever, ever, ever. So collaborate. 
that the, this third point is be nice. I wrote be nice, but it's really collaborate. Don't compete. Don't be a gunner. Don't throw somebody else under the bus for your gain. Do not, do not, do not, because it will come back to hurt you in the end. All right, the fourth thing here. I've heard from too many students that email me or I talk to that talk about getting a poor score on the MCAT. And when I ask them, how did you prepare? How many practice tests did you take? They usually say, oh, I took one or I didn't take any. I didn't think I would need to practice for it. I'm a good student. I'm a good test taker. This fourth point here is you need to respect the MCAT. And yes, I love that hashtag, respect the MCAT. So if you're using Twitter, go use that, respect the MCAT hashtag. It's an awesome one. I made it up here a long time ago. <laughs> so you need to understand that the MCAT is not like school. It's not like the tests that you take in, in your classes. It is not a test that a teacher teaches you the information that he's then going to turn around and test you on. You need to practice for the MCAT just like you're going to take the real MCAT. Sit down for eight hours on a Saturday or whatever day you're taking the MCAT and, and go through several practice tests, many, many practice tests, and figure it out. Next Step Test Prep has some practice tests they have 10 practice tests for the new MCAT. You can use the code MSHQ and save some money on those 10 practice tests. I highly recommend that you take a lot of practice tests. All right. That is respect the MCAT. That's number four on my list. Number five, and we kind of already talked about this already, but you need to respect, and not respect, you need to understand that there is not a checklist for medical school. I cannot sit down and tell you everything that you need to do to get into medical school. Because if, if I give you all of the ingredients to, to get into medical school, I give you all of the ingredients, and I give that to the, you know, the, the classmate sitting next to you, just like in cooking, I can give you all of the ingredients and you both come back to me with totally, completely different dinners. There isn't a checklist. You need to go through this process, experience everything on your own. Not, not, not really on your own, but through your own eyes, through your own experiences and figure out what directions you want to go in. Do you want to do research? Is that something that is going to interest you? Great, go look at it. You don't have to do research. Talking about the Facebook group, there's a, a thread that happened in the last couple of days. Somebody went to their professor and asked about research, and he said, don't do it, you're wasting your time. He, he mentioned that he's on the admissions committee at the local medical school, and that they they ignore research or they, they don't value research as an admissions committee because I'm assuming they think that every student is doing it just to check a box. And so my response to her was, yes, if you're doing it just to try to make yourself look good to the admissions committee, show off for the admissions committee, add it to your application, then don't do it. If you're doing it because you think you might be interested in doing research and you want to try to participate in research and see what research is all about, then great, go do it. Because then you can talk about it. You're gonna enjoy talking about it. You're gonna enjoy writing about it for your applications. But beyond that, there isn't a checklist. Don't do things because you think it's going to look good to the admissions committee. They, they can see right through that. All right, speaking of applications, this sixth one on here, I wish every student knew this from day one, starting undergrad. You need to apply to medical school early. I hate, and, and hate is a strong word, but I hate that medical schools have deadlines for the AMCAS application or for the primary application, whether it's 
the the AMCAS, the ACOMIS, or the TMDSAS, the Texas Medical and Dental School Application Service, which I don't usually mention on here because it's it's very similar to the other ones. Medical schools have deadlines for the primary application, and and so somebody who doesn't understand rolling admissions and that by the time the deadline rolls around, the schools have have pretty close to filled all of their spots for interviews and pretty close to filled their, their, their students that they're accepting. And so students that are applying at that deadline date thinking, oh, it's, it's fine, it's a deadline. I, I got my application in before the deadline. That means I'm fine, I have a chance. The students that do that have slim to none chance of getting in to medical school because of what I mentioned earlier rolling admissions and and having having the schools have already the, the schools have already filled up their spots for for interviews and and seats for the medical school so you need to understand that you have to apply early and that's usually around June every year depending on which application service you're using all right the seventh one on here writing your personal statement is hard I wish students would understand, or students, pre-med students would know, that writing your personal statement is hard. It is hard to write about yourself. And the majority of students typically write a biography, or I guess an autobiography in this case. Hopefully it's an autobiography. Don't, don't let somebody else write your personal statement for you. That's uh, illegal in the, the application services minds. But the, a lot of students will approach this as a autobiography of everything that they've done with their life. And that's not what the personal statement's for. The personal statement is to tell me, the admissions committee member, why you want to be a physician. And so you need to, to talk about your initial exposures to medicine. What was that initial seed that got planted in your head? And then what has been watering that seed all along the way? Why do you continue to want to be a physician? Why do you want to, quote unquote, waste four years of your life, get into hundreds of thousand dollars dollars of debt to become a physician? What is driving you? What's motivating you? And it's hard to do that. And you're going to need to go through several, several drafts of your personal statement. And I, I do personal statement editing, if that's ever something you're interested in just go to medicalschoolhq.net and at the top click on the our services i've i've read a lot of personal statements i actually just started my my new book all about writing the personal statement it's it's hard and and you need to to be able to talk about what you're doing and show me why you want to be a physician so i, I wish students would know how hard it was but what's even harder this next one here writing your extracurricular descriptions. So the personal statement, depending on which application service you're using, you get 5,300 for AMCAS, you get 4,500 for ACOMIS, and I think you get like 4,800 or something for the Texas application. Texas always has to be different. I don't know why. <laughs> anyway, um, your extracurricular descriptions, you get 725 roughly uh, characters I think I think that's it. Roughly around there, you get you get seven hundred plus characters to write your description for an extracurricular activity, and so it's hard to squeeze everything into that description. And the majority of people write a job statement, a duty statement. What did you do during your time there? And that's not personal enough. You need to talk about what, the impact that you specifically had on whatever the extracurricular was so that the description is specific to you and not just a job description that anybody that has worked in that same job could say the same thing about. So you, you're going to take a lot of time to write your personal statement. You're going to take a lot of time to write these extracurricular descriptions. And then on top of that, the most meaningful ones for the applications as well. So you get more space to write and talk about why it's most meaningful. 
All right, this next one here, too often. So this is number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Number nine, I should have numbered these beforehand. <laughs> number nine here, too often I hear from students that I'm working with preparing, helping them prepare their applications. And, and part of that is, okay, who are you going to get letters of recommendation from? And too often I hear, I don't know, I didn't have a relationship with my professors. They don't know me. I never spent time to get to know them. And they're kind of dead in the water at that point because they, they're still going to need a, uh, a letter of recommendation. And now they're going to have to ask for one from somebody that doesn't know them. And that's not going to be a very helpful letter of recommendation. So as you're going through your schooling, especially in those last couple years, because a letter of recommendation from a, a freshman chemistry teacher isn't going to hold much weight because you've changed from your freshman year to when you're applying. So you're going to need some letters from those later professors. And it's going to have to be somebody who knows you. So you need to turn off your introvert self and get out there and go to office hours, introduce yourself to professors, to TAs, whoever is there helping. Get out there and make yourself known so that at the end of the semester, quarter, whatever system you're in, you can go to that professor and and greet them and talk to them just like your old pals and, and say, oh, re remember I told you I was applying to medical school? I had a great time this semester with you. I was hoping you, you would be able to write me a strong, that keyword there, strong letter of recommendation. So get out there and know your professors. Another one here, number 10, kind of related to the application process, is know why you are applying to the schools that you're applying to. Again, often talking to school, talking to students about their school lists, they, I, I, and let me, I'm going to change this one mid, mid, mid thought. So not necessarily why you are applying to school there, but apply to schools, not just because they fit with inside your GPA and MCAT range. Too often, students look at their GPA, look at their MCAT score, go to, the, go to the MSAR, the Medical School Application Requirements by the AAMC. They go to that and go, okay, here's my GPA, here's my MCAT score, what schools should I apply to? And that's the wrong way to go about applying to school. You need to apply to schools that are going to be a fit for you. Just like at the very beginning, we talked about applying to undergrad institutions, ones that will fit with you, you need to apply to medical schools the same way, not just because they they fit your MCAT and GPA. You, you need to look at location, look at weather, look at class size, look at curriculum, look at research that's going on there, look at affiliated hospitals, look at so many other things, and go from there. You have to remember that when you look at GPA and MCAT averages, that is a number derived from a lot of high numbers and a lot of low numbers, and it's all squished together into one number. And so just because it fits with your number doesn't mean that somebody that has uh, a half a percent of a GPA or a half of a tenth uh, less than uh, a GPA than you doesn't mean that they're outside, quote unquote, outside this range because that average score that you're looking at has GPAs that that low in there. So don't look at GPA and MCAT averages to pick the schools you're going to. Understand why you're picking the schools outside of GPA and MCAT. Again, I talked about them, location, class size, curriculum, research, all of these other things that you could be looking at. All right, number 11 here. Just like we talked about with the MCAT, you need to prepare for your interviews. And I'll give you a specific example of a student that I did mock interviews with this year. She applied last year. She's got great stats, good score, underrepresented minority, a female, 
should have been a shoe in for the schools that she was applying to. And she was applying to some good schools. She got interviews at a lot of schools and she didn't get in anywhere. And so the second time around, this was last year, the second time around, she said, you know what? The one thing I didn't do last year was go through mock interview prep. So she bit the bullet. She bought some mock interview sessions with me and we worked hard on helping her answer the questions better. And there was a huge change from interview one to interview four with the 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 message that she was getting out and getting across. A lot of it at the beginning was a little bit more negative, and at the end it was a lot more positive. And it's only October 18th as I'm recording this, and she already has two acceptances and is waiting on many more. And I have a feeling she's going to be like Jessica last year who got 10 acceptances to medical school. This this girl is going to to be a rock star and get a lot of acceptances because she deserves them. She's worked hard. She's an amazing student, an amazing person. She just needed to hone her interview skills and hone her message. And she did that through mock interview prep with me. You don't have to do it with me specifically, but that's what I that's what I've done with her. Again, I do mock interview prep. If you're interested in it, go to medicalschoolhq.net and at the top there, see the uh, our services menu option. So prepare for the interview just like you're preparing for the MCAT. Sit through these quote-unquote practice tests, also known as mock interviews, for your interview process. All right, this last one here, number 12. As you go through this process, it's long and it's, it's cliche to, to say that it's a, a marathon, not a sprint, but it is. It's a long process. It's an expensive process. It is grueling. It is painful. It is defeating. Uh, it is frustrating. It is exhilarating. It's a little bit of everything. And as you go through this process, if you don't keep in mind why you're doing it, then you're going to lose track of yourself. And you're going to allow those tough times to overcome you. And you're going to get down. You're going to get depressed. You're going to want to quit. So always, always keep in mind. I wish every pre-med student would know to always keep in mind why they are doing this. When you have those long days of MCAT prep, remember why you're doing it. Picture that patient that you saw while you were a shadow. Picture that patient you saw when you were volunteering at the hospital. Picture yourself in scrubs one day with that stethoscope around your neck, with that short coat on, walking around the hospital, helping people heal. Picture yourself doing that. Know why you're doing it. And you'll get through these tough days better and easier and less jaded and less frustrated and more willing on the other end to to help everybody, including your patients, including your classmates, know why you're doing it. All right, so those were 12 things that I wish every pre-med student would know. And so I've dug in on these topics a lot deeper on other episodes, if that's something that interests you. This is episode 204. That means there are 203 other episodes, if you haven't listened to those, to go back and listen to and really understand a lot more in depth why I talk about what I talk about and why I think these are important. I wish you the best of luck on this journey. It is hard, it is long, but it is worth it. I want to take a second and thank a couple people that have left ratings and reviews in iTunes. We have one here from Bree City that says, I love Ryan's professionalism throughout every episode. The show has given me an incredible amount of insight and resources that I now have in my arsenal as I prepare for mentally and literally for medical school. It is so uplifting, and the overall theme is to never give up your dream of becoming a physician because anything is possible. I love this podcast, and I'm so happy I found it for anyone, especially non-trads, it is a must listen. So thank you for that, Bree City. The title of that one is incredible and inspiring. That's awesome. Thank you. Great review. 
We have another one here from Yella, Y-E-L-A-H, that says, reapplicant accepted, exclamation point, exclamation point, exclamation point, exclamation point. Thank you so much for this wonderful podcast. Not being accepted to medical school my first year applying was so difficult. But this podcast gave me the tools to reevaluate my application and make the changes to become accepted. I would recommend this to everyone seeking advice on preparing and applying to medical school. So that's the perfect, perfect review right there. The perfect um, write-up is exactly why I do this podcast. So if you're one of these students that's struggling, go listen. If you don't subscribe, if you haven't listened to this podcast before, go listen. And if you have listened to the podcast, or if this is your first one and you feel like it's already life-changing, I would love a rating interview. Medicalschoolhq.net slash iTunes is the place to do that. All right. I hope you have a great week. Again, I think this is an episode that will kind of live on forever, as do all of them, but this one more specifically, as far as you re-listening to it, I hope it, it serves you in that purpose. And as always, I hope you join me next week here at the Medical School Headquarters and the Pre-Med Years Podcast.